Welcome to Morning Infusion with Dr. V, where we are intentional about connecting you with leaders that have overcome so that you know that the possibilities are endless. It's Dr. V here, where our coaching program teaches nurses to work from their computers around the world, making money and owning their own time. Our featured guest today is Marquita Fields. Dr. Marquita Fields is an advanced practice registered nurse. She is the CEO of Fields Harvest Consulting. She is a nurse, author, teacher, and entrepreneur. She is inspired by women leaders, nurse changing the world, and diversity in all spaces. So welcome, welcome, welcome. So now you said that you were in high school and you had a project to do, but did not know what to do. Now... Mm -hmm. How did James Brown, your preceptor, <laughs> okay, well, tell us about James Brown, because James Brown wasn't the typical James Brown. No. Um, so we had to do a senior project in high school. And um, one of the things that we had to do was hook up with a mentor in some field that we were interested in and kind of shadow them and see what their life was like and write a paper about it. And we had to do so many hours in that field. And I was just like, I don't know what I want to do. And they had mentors that were available and I didn't have to look for one. So I was like, oh, I'll do that. That's easy. <laughs> and so I was assigned to Mr. James Brown, who was a registered nurse in the pediatric uh, floor at the hospital. James Brown and my brain was like, you know, the big payback, <laughs> James Brown. <laughs> But when I met James Brown, he was a white male with red hair and blue eyes. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is going to be different. <laughs> so now, then what did he help you do with the project? What was the project about? So he was the first person that made me feel like, you know, it wasn't an option. You're going to be a nurse. And he kind of showed me the ropes of what nursing was all about. I thought nursing was just, you know, you wore a little white dress, a little white hat. You listened to the little doctors and you walked around and that's all you did. And he showed me how to care for patients, how to be there and sit in there and hold patients, talk to them, um, how to analytically think about what you're doing and the care that you're providing and the whole professionalism side of things, you know, how to delegate, how to be a leader in your, your workplace. And I was like, wow, I can do that. And he, he didn't even give me the option to do anything else. He said, this is what you're going to do. And I so love it. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to um, this young man the other day. So he called me up. He called me up specifically because he wanted to know how to get hours at the hospital. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, what are you trying to do? And he said, I'm, I'm trying to be a PA. And mm -hmm. I said, you're trying to be a PA. And he said, yes. And so I said, well, are you trying? What are you know, what exact, I said, are you in the program? What exactly is going on? And he said, no, I'm not in the program, but unless like you have some previous experience, like you've been a, a you know, a paramedic, mm -hmm. then coming into the program will be, is, you know, you have to have a certain number of hours. And I was right. like, I was like, so why don't you just become a nurse? And he was like, well, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. And I don't think that that's, I said, look, let me tell you something. I said, you take, I said, as a nurse, you got to take that NCLEX once. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. As a PA, you got to take that dog on that. I said, you got to take that test every five yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. we got time for that foolishness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I don't love PAs. I, we love y'all. Okay. But <laughs> I mean, if we, if we want to go there, right. Yeah. I agree completely. I completely agree. So now there was a time during your nursing career when you were burned out. Why do you think that this happened? And what was some advice that you would give some of those in the nursing profession that but to battle burnout? So for me, it was probably around the 10 year mark of being a registered nurse. And I had done a lot of different things and I'd gotten really good at uh, surgical nursing, which is what I was doing at that moment. And I think once you get really, um, you know, there's that Benner's model of like novice to expert. When you get to the expert at something and you feel like you can't learn anymore, it's time to change, do something different. And the beautiful thing about nursing is that there's a million different things you can do. That and, part. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I, I was finding that was like going through the rigmarole. 
clock in 645, take care of the patients or charge nurse or whatever I had to do that day and then go home and do it all over again. And it was getting very repetitious and not very enjoying, not very joyful, I guess. And so I decided to go into education and um, did that for a little while because I thought maybe that would be something I wanted to do. And not knocking anyone that does education, but that is not the area for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not the traditional hospital education in that realm. Um, and so then I decided, hey, let's go back to school and do nurse practitioner. Let's have a different uh, perspective from the nursing uh, avenue. And I thought that that would be a good avenue to go in. And it was it was so worth it. Every last minute of it. But I think, that you know, it's very valuable what you said about um, that monotonous routine. And mm -hmm. I am a huge on professional development. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think professional development is so important is because professional development gives you what you need in order to be able to um in order to be able to advance, because if you're not advanced and you're staying stagnant and typically Absolutely. if you're stagnant, then you're moving backwards. Mm -hmm. And so tell me about when you said that education was not for you. So tell me why education was not for you. So tell me a little bit about that. So the facility I worked at, um, their education model was you'd have a nurse, a nurse that educated several floors and you uh, did on one-on-one -on -one training and training with staff members one-on-one -on -one just on different floors. And it would not necessarily be your floor of expertise. So say I'm a surgical nurse, but I'm training on a pediatric floor. Yeah, <laughs> you just got assigned to wherever there was a need. And I didn't like it because I felt like I wasn't able to pour into people exactly what my expertise were was. And it was very structured in a way that was... Um, overall cookie cutter instead of personalized. Um, I felt like, you know, when, in, in my day, when I started nursing and I grew up, <laughs> mm -hmm. you learned from your preceptors on the floor. They got out there with you. You had a load of patients and they were accept accessible to you and you learned that way. And it was the best way to learn. And so I felt like I couldn't give the people I, were te I was teaching that kind of experience. Yeah. And I think that that's probably, you know, and not knocking that, but I think that that's probably the reason why you were able to move from that space. And that mm -hmm. was meant to be because that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, as an ER <laughs> nurse, I can't go in and teach ICU as an ER nurse. You know, mm -hmm. I probably can go to the med surge floor. Right. But, you know, I, you know, I can't. I can probably go to pediatrics even, right? Mm -hmm. so, but it's really, I. but what I can do is go to the women's center, okay? Let's be very clear on that, okay? Exactly. You know, and so that that just, I don't I don't know where they got that. <laughs> right. I thought it was the, the weirdest way of doing things, but I mean, it worked for, it worked with budget cuts, you know, as all fields are taken, you know, where instead of having one designated person for one floor, you have people for, you know, all of a section and you have less people you have to hire for that than you do for others. But the so. reality is that that's not good for the patient, though. Exactly. At the end of the day, the patient right. is not cared for with a specialty that they need to be cared for. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so that that's just not even good. But whatever. That's, the, you know, that's them. <laughs> we just we just here to, to bring knowledge to the crew. Right. Now, right. what is the reason why you wanted to get your DMP? Uh, so it was an accident. <laughs> You'll get your DMP on accident. <laughs> to the crowd. I decided after doing my education stint, I decided I want to do my nurse practitioner. I said, uh -huh. I want to be a family nurse practitioner. I want to take care of people from the other side of things. Because as nurses, we diagnose anyway. We're just not allowed to legally. But I mean, you know what's wrong with your patient. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I thought, okay, I want to be a nurse practitioner. I lived at that time in Greenville, North Carolina. The closest school to me was East Carolina University, who did not offer a master's program for nurse practitioner. Oh. And so the only way I could do a nurse practitioner in my local area was to do the doctoral of nursing practice. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how that happened. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll just do the DMP. I'll just have a terminal degree instead and 
you know, that'll be fine. And so that's kind of how I ended up with the DMP. <laughs> gotcha. Now that, that might be an accident. I'll give you that. <laughs> I'll give you that. I'll give you that. <laughs> so sorry. How you just how you just roll into that? I know. <laughs> so now you went into urology. Mm -hmm. What was your rationale for picking this is a specialty? <laughs> Out of all the specialties, I know, all the things I could have done. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I worked as a surgical nurse. I worked with all different types of physicians and MPs and PAs. And I was very fortunate to meet a group of providers that was very nurturing, uh, that were very um, down to earth. And I felt like, hey, my personality meshes well with them. I feel like I, I know a little bit coming to the table and I feel like they'll nurture me to become a good provider because you start over. Once you get your nurse practitioner, you, you have this nursing background, but it's a different profession. So you, you learn a little bit differently. And so that kind of led me in that direction. What I did not know was all of the urology outpatient stuff that I would be doing. And boy, is it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I don't even, <laughs> I can imagine. So now tell me, um, so as it relates to you going from nurse to nurse practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. So tell me some of the, the nuances of that. So tell me some of the ways in which you were able to do that successfully and not struggle because you really go back to novice once you go to an MP. Okay. That's what I've heard. Now, my DMP is in leadership, um, so it's a little bit different, um, mm -hmm. but... You know, just tell me just some of the nuances in going into practice that way. Um, so one of the things about uh, make sure I answer your question correctly. So you, you wanted to know, like, what is the mindset from being a nurse to going to an NP? Like, how did you navigate that those roles? Um. So the, the biggest thing is um, getting over imposter syndrome. Uh, that's that, what someone else said to me. S.D. Grendel said that. Uh-huh. Because you, you feel like, you know, oh, my gosh, I'm the one writing this order. I, I, I was just a nurse Friday. How am I writing the orders on Monday? <laughs> and so, like, that part was a little bit difficult. Uh, but I think I had really good mentors that allowed me to realize, hey, no, this is what you trained for. And you know these things, you know, just think of it as a nurse. Think of it as if you were on that floor taking care of that patient. What does that patient need? And work off that. Go strictly just think about your patient. Don't think about, you know, you're this role and they're that role or whatever. Just think about what does your patient need and take care of your patient. And once I did that, it was a lot easier. Also, not working where I started off. I worked in the same facility, but not on the same floor as a nurse practitioner. And I learned a long time ago from a previous uh, mentor that I had that it's hard to grow where you are. And so sometimes it's better to go to a different area. So instead of me working on the same floor as a nurse practitioner, I went to a different area so that I could command the same level of respect as all the other providers. Because, you know, that's hard. That, that's difficult for people that work side by side with you to see you in a different role. And so I think that helped a lot, not in that area. I love it. So now your husband is a nurse. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of having a nursing spouse? Yes, he drank the Kool-Aid and became a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> um, the advantages are, so the advantage is our conversations are about medicine and about healthcare are very candid and no hold bars. Our poor kids know a lot about IVs and all types of medical stuff that we just talk about just in general. Uh, the So that's kind of nice. I can talk to him and I don't have to water it down. I can say, you know, this this whole process of what we're doing with this is not really working or, you know, and it it's easy um, language. The disadvantages are I can't get anything by on him. Like I can't say, oh, I got a headache or something like that. He's like, well, why didn't you take the Motrin? <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> you didn't take your Zyrtec last night. This is why your allergies, you know, so I can't get that. <laughs> yeah, that can be a disadvantage because, you know, we'll let you have pneumonia. You know how that is, right? right. <laughs> you'll go to work with pneumonia and we'll be yeah. like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> 
<laughs> my husband says that all the time. He's like, you give me no slack. And I'm mm-hmm. like, I just, I you know, like, I see people dying. So I right. str- struggle, I struggle. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so now you teach in the nurse practitioner program. What is the advantages and disadvantages? Now, so you said that you don't like education, but you like it, education in the, in the, I guess in academia, like in the... Um... Right. So I teach in a program that is a nurse practitioner residency. Mm-hmm. So uh, what this is, is like nurse practitioners, physician assistants um, that have already started working, that their employer wants to give them some enrichment. And so they, they're they learning like different parts about being a provider outside of school. Ah, gotcha. mm-hmm. gotcha. And I love it because... I get to teach what I want to teach and what I'm passionate about, which is a game changer from teaching something I had no idea about. (laughs) Yeah. And it does make a difference. It really does make a difference as to what Mm -hmm. you teach about and what you like, you know, what your target audience is. Right. Right. And that's, you know, that's the same in business. So I tell people all the time that if you want to, if you want to learn how to grow your CNA school, or if you want mm-hmm. to learn how to grow your phlebotomy school, like I'm not your girl, right? Because right. that's not my passion. That's not what mm-hmm. I want to do. I know that there are people out there that do that, but right. I teach a bit of a different aspect of nursing and business. And so it's, it's huge. Now you teach diversity and inclusion. Why mm-hmm. is it such a passion for you? So when I finished NP school, um, one of the things I noticed was that there were not a lot of people in provider roles at my current mm-hmm. facility that looked like me. And I thought, wow, this is lonely. <laughs> and I said, OK, well, I wonder if I'm the only person experiencing this. And so I wanted to create an area that was a safe space and a networking space for people of color. And so that's kind of how that came about. Gotcha. Now. Tell us about microaggressions. What are they and why are they, um, and what are some ways that you deal with them? So uh, so microaggressions came about because kind of in that same realm, I was working and seeing that because I was one of the only people that looked like me, a lot of my colleagues did not know how to address certain things and they were saying things not you know all well intentioned but really it was kind of an aggressive type thing so for example like i would hear a comment about something this was during the time of george floyd and brianna taylor and you know all these different things that were going on in the national setting and my colleagues would say things and then look at me for the black perspective i i I felt like it was like you need to give the black perspective and i don't think they meant it in a bad way they really want to know my opinion but it it's still a microaggression and the way I knew it, cause it didn't feel right. <laughs> well, now tell me, tell me an instance, tell me what, like a specific question, for example. Oh, um, you know, you know, one of the things I remember hearing, uh, was, you know, you are so educated and, and you're so, you know, very professional, not what I would have expected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you expect you know (laughs) you know or um you you have um i've heard you're like the least black person that i know or something like that or you know you're the whitest black person that i know and i'm like what 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 does that mean (laughs) so things like that and i think they were thinking they were making a compliment but it's not a compliment you know what i mean it's it's actually quite the opposite. And so just educating people on these sort of things, educating folks in, in the best way possible, because that's a great area where you can go and turn into the angry, loud, irritated person. Or you can really take a moment to educate someone so they didn't they never do this again. And so those opportunities kept arising and it became more evident last year with all of what was going on. So I was like, oh, this will be a perfect opportunity to do that. And so there's microaggressions and there's macroaggressions, too, where people just say stuff straight out the gate. That's just wrong. (laughs) You know, like so that kind of helped, too. Gotcha. Gotcha. I love it. Now, tell me a book that has um, impacted you and why was it so impactful? 
Mm. There is a book I read last year because I read it all the time, but this one was really good. It was called Home Going by mm-hmm. Yara Gyasi, and mm-hmm. I may be butchering her name, uh, but it's a book that discusses two women. They were both born in Africa. They're sisters, and they're born in two different tribes, and it follows the lineage of these two women um, over the course of about 100 years. Mm. They're born back when slavery had just begun and it brings them up to now. And you see just how the pathway, one was sold into slavery, one was not and lived in Africa. And you see the pathways of how um, African-American and African lives would be different had we not had ancestry over here versus ancestry there. It's just to see the parallel. And how oh. mm-hmm. and it's called Homebound? Home going. Home going. Yara Giyashi. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. It was really interesting because you you identify with so many parts of it. And it it's kind of wore this one of those things where you're like, oh, this happened because of this, and this happened because of that. Especially now when you're looking at like, you know, the big topic is institutional racism and those sort of things. You look back at this and you see why these things happen now. It's because of all the things that happened in the past. And it was really insightful. I think that was probably my recent, you know, the, my recent book that probably have impacted me. Gotcha. I love it. I love it. I'm going to have to go out and look for that one. Mm-hmm. Um, now, tell us a person that has impacted your career, your life, and your career as a nurse. Uh, that would be kind of got two people. Okay. <laughs> one would be my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was very special to me. She was very um, pro me. (laughs) She was pro me, like whatever I wanted to do, she was all for it. And so she was very supportive in this, in the sense that, you know, no one in my family went to college. No one hardly graduated high school. And so for someone to graduate high school, go to college, to do anything more than middle school was a big deal. And so she was very much an advocate of whatever I did, get my education. And so that I had had in the back of my head every time I did anything. And so that was really impactful for me. I was like, I got to make granny proud. (laughs) Um, And then the other person would probably be my mom. She got very ill and had a severe stroke a couple years back and having to take care of her and be nurse at home was a whole different animal than taking care of people, you know, in the institutional setting. And so it impacted our whole family. It's actually why my husband went back to nursing school, just having to take care of her. And so just kind of wanted to be more of a nurturer of a nurse than just at work, doing it at home and kind of seeing how it comes full circle. And, you know, and that's that's really, really good, because, you know, once you set that expectation for your children, Mm -hmm. you set that expectation from for them. A lot of times, a lot of people don't set the expectation for their children. Right. And so, um, you know, it's just like you you kind of do what you do. Right. And so so some people learn by their, you know, each instance where they are in life, they are they learn how to do or learn how to level up. Mm -hmm. But it's important that, you know, your home life at home is where you should learn that the the, for the most part. Right. And so, you know, it it was kind of funny you said that because this morning, you know, my grandkids were here, my two grandboys and we were um, we were talking and I said, you know, you you guys are going to grow up to be phenomenal men. Right. You're going to be amazing men. And, you know, just learning that you were just raising. And I didn't know this when I was, you know, a young mother. I didn't get it. Right. I didn't get that. I'm raising small humans, you know, adults, small adults. Right. And so I have to speak to them like they're adults. And I have to, you know, I have to be that. You know, this is where we're going. This is the trajectory of your life. And it's going to be very different. And so that's huge. That's huge. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing up today. Um, So um, we have just finished our VP Nursing Business Academy four day master class. It was such a phenomenal event. You still have time to sign up for VP Nursing Business Academy. 
We can jump on a call so you're able to gain clarity on how to create multiple streams of income. You can sign up at vpnursing.com. I ask that you like and share this um, podcast. And Morning Infusion is all about where we're intentional about connecting you with leaders that have overcome, such as Dr. Fields. So thank you, Dr. Fields, for showing up. And you guys have a phenomenal day.